When we talk about the greatest teams to never make the finals, we mostly think about teams that suffered heartbreaking losses in the playoffs. The teams that come up the most are the 2000 Portland Trailblazers, the 2002 Sacramento Kings, the 2007 Phoenix Suns, and the 2018 Houston Rockets. There were either injuries, suspensions, or controversial officiating that prevented these teams from advancing to the finals. But there are other teams that are in this abyss of forgotten great teams, and it's time to shed a light on them. There are four different teams that according to the numbers have one of the most dominant regular seasons of all time, but they never get brought up by the mainstream media. And we're gonna talk about them today. So there are two different stats that we're gonna be focusing on that are gonna be the basis of this short list. Those two things are margin of victory and simple rating system. Here's a brief description of those two stats. Margin of victory is pretty self-explanatory. It's basically the average of points that a team defeated their opponents by during the season. Now for the simple rating system, it's a rating that takes into account the average point differential and strength of schedule. This is what Mike Litch wrote for the Sports Reference blog that will give us a better understanding of what this is. And he gave this example. He wrote, the 2007 Spurs won games by an average of 8.43 points per game and played a schedule with opponents that were 0.08 points worse than average, giving them a simple rating system of 8.35. This means they were 8.35 points better than an average team. An average team would have a simple rating system of 0.0. So these two stats paint us an accurate picture of how dominant a team was during the season, instead of just using their win and loss record. With that out the way, the first thing that we're going to talk about is the 1986 Milwaukee Bucks. Let's take a look at their numbers for the season. We can see that they had the third best record in the league behind the Boston Celtics and the Lakers. The numbers also indicate that they were a top five offensive and defensive team in the league. But what we're focusing on is margin of victory and simple rating system. Notice that they had the 23rd highest margin of victory in NBA history. That's better than teams like the 1997 Utah Jazz, the 2000 Lakers, the 2018 Houston Rockets, and the 2013 Miami Heat. They also had the 17th highest simple rating system of all time. They had a better simple rating system than the 1991 Chicago Bulls, the 1987 Lakers, and the 1970 New York Knicks. That is some serious company from this forgotten team of the 80s. When we think of this decade, we usually think of the Lakers, the Celtics, the Sixers, the Pistons, the Hawks, and even the Bulls. But this team doesn't get brought up nearly enough. However, they had six 50-win seasons and one 60-win season during that decade. They also had two different appearances in the conference finals. This was a very strong team that played in a conference that featured a lot of legendary players. The unfortunate thing is that they peaked in the same year that the Boston Celtics did, who ended up having arguably the greatest season of all time. And they just got swept by this juggernaut of a team in the conference finals. The Bucks were great, but they weren't at that level. So it makes sense that they've been overshadowed by the Celtics. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the 1991 Portland Trail Blazers. Let's take a look at their numbers for the season. They had the best record in the league. They were a top three offensive team and they were one of the strongest defensive teams. They had the 27th highest margin of victory for a single season and the 22nd highest simple rating system of all time. They are just below the 1986 bucks for both categories. So the numbers give us a little taste of how dominant the Blazers were that season. But there are some other little factoids about that season that gives us an idea of how great this team was. They started the season winning 11 games in a row, and then they had a 16 game winning streak at the end of the season. The game that stands out to me was when they played the San Antonio Spurs early in the season. In the first quarter, they made 22 out of 25 shots and led by a score of 49 to 18. They called it a quarter of perfect basketball. They also had two incredible comebacks during the season. 
They came back from 24 down in the third quarter to beat the Sonics. And then they came back from 21 down in the third quarter to beat the Lakers during that 16 game winning streak. This was just a complete team. Take a look at this next interesting stat that proves that. They had a total of seven players that averaged in double figures. From top to bottom, this was the deepest team in the league. For example, they had two former All-Star veterans, Buck Williams and Walter Davis. Then they had the championship experience that Danny A's brought to the table. Kevin Duckworth and Terry Porter made the All-Star team that year. And Terry Porter might have had the most underrated season out of all the players from the Blazers. Because believe it or not, Terry Porter led the team in win shares that season. And of course, you had NBA legend Clyde Trexler. He was arguably the best all-around player in the league, as he was the only player to average at least 20 points, 6 rebounds, and 6 assists for the season. This also proves that Drexler was more than capable of leading a team to an historic season. And think about the three-year stretch the Blazers had from 1990 to 1992. They made the finals in 1990 and 1992. And then they had this dominating season in 1991. So this wasn't a one-year sample. The Blazers were a problem for the league in the early 90s. They just lost to teams that had legendary players like Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson, and Michael Jordan. Drexler just couldn't take his game to that other level when playing against those teams. The next team that we're going to talk about is the 1994 Seattle Supersonics. Let's take a look at their numbers for the season. They also had the best record in the league, and they were top three defensive and offensive team. And as we can see, they had the 22nd highest margin of victory and the 18th highest simple rating system of all time. So what was the key to their dominance? Well, there's a couple of things to note. Their defense, led by Gary Payton, was relentless, and their goal was to force as many turnovers as possible to generate easy baskets on the other end. Head coach George Carl and assistant coach Bob Kloppenberg believed in trapping all over the court and switching constantly. Gary Payton and Nate McMillan led the charge on their defensive attack and it led to some historic numbers. They posted the second most total steals in NBA history. As you can see, they're only one of two teams in history to post over 1,000 steals in a season. And if you look at their average steals per game, they were just 0.2 steals shy of having the all-time record. And on the offensive end, they implemented a balanced scoring attack to try to get the most of the various capable scores that they had. Sean Kemp and Gary Payton obviously led the way, but they also had all-star caliber players like Detlef Shrimp and Ricky Pierce. Kendall Gill was more than capable of generating offense for himself, and Sam Perkins was a modern center that could spread the floor with his three-point shooting. They just had so many different ways of beating you. In fact, the Sonics became the first team in NBA history to have 10 double-figure scores in one game as they recorded the highest points total of the season in a 150-101 to route of the Los Angeles Clippers. This was a team that was destined to be the next powerhouse of the league. The unfortunate thing is that when we remember the legacy of the 1994 Sonics, we think of their playoff disappointment of becoming the first team in NBA history to lose in the first round as the number one seed. That just completely overshadows what they accomplished in the regular season. They were all time great, but they certainly had their flaws. The problem with this team, and Gary Payne has mentioned this before, is his team wasn't ready to win. They lacked maturity, and they couldn't get their offense going with the Kembe Mutombo shutting down the middle. It was a bad matchup for the Sonics, and ultimately, just bad timing. The last thing that we're going to talk about is the 2013 OKC Thunder. Let's take a look at their numbers for the season. You know all that talk that was going on about Russell Westbrook early in the 2021-22 season? Where they were basically saying that it's impossible to win if Brody's on your team? Call me crazy, but did we already forget that the Thunder went to the finals in 2012? 
with Westbrook as the second best player? Yes, I know they had one of the five best shooting guards of all time just sitting there in the bench. I know that James Harden had a lot to do with their success. But I will say this. When Harden signed with the Rockets, nobody thought that the Thunder were going to be a better team after losing a player like that. Nobody did. Trust me. I read all the season previews that were written prior to that season starting. They not only got better, but they quietly had one of the most dominant seasons in the history of the league. As you might have noticed, they had the highest margin of victory and simple rating system from the four teams that we mentioned. And the fact that there hasn't been 20 teams in the history of the league that has had a higher margin of victory for a single season is something that we just can't gloss over. So I guess Westbrook wasn't that detrimental to the team. Especially if we're talking about a team that won 60 games. So there's no question he played a big part in their success. But Kevin Durant was the one that made a huge leap in his progression. He was a top three player in the league. He ended up having one of the most efficient shooting seasons ever. He averaged 28.1 points per game while shooting over 50% from the field, 40% from the three, and 90% from the free throw line. He made the famous 50-40-90 club. But there's more to it than just merely making that prestigious club of shooters. In fact, that is the third highest scoring average from a player that had those shooting averages behind only Steph Curry and Larry Bird. It was an all-time great season from an all-time great player. And he played a huge part that contributed to the Thunder having such an efficient offense. They finished second in true shooting percentage and third in effective field goal percentage that season. When you have the playmaker that Westbrook is and Durant getting all the attention from the defense, it just opens up the floor for everyone else. And their teammates took advantage of the open shots that the defense was giving them. Most notably was Kevin Martin. He averaged 14 points per game while shooting over 42% from the three. When he had it going, this team was just blowing everybody out. Just look at their margin of victory when he scored over 19 points. It's just too bad that the Thunder didn't see the value in keeping him. Because they traded him in the offseason for cash. They sent him packing to the Minnesota Timberwolves. And in return, they got $7 million trade exception. So there's that. And then you had Serge Ibaka, who averaged 3 blocks per game. And he finished 3rd in Defensive Player of the Year voting. I'm including myself here, but I think many of us forgot how great this team was. This was a deep squad, but understandably, they got overshadowed by the Miami Heat, who had an all-time great season. They had the best record in the league, they won 27 straight games, and they had the MVP of the league, LeBron James, who was at the peak of his powers. This was the apex of Heatles mania, so it only makes sense that they got all the attention from the NBA world. Then the playoffs came around, and Patrick Beverly became a household name for NBA fans when he went for the knees. <coughs> Excuse me, my bad. I meant he went for the ball, and that just ruined the Thunder's chances of making any run in the playoffs. And that contributed to this team being largely forgotten by the NBA world. I personally don't think that they would have been neither the Spurs nor the Heat in the playoffs. But you never know. Imagine what another finals appearance would have done to the legacies of KD and especially Russell Westbrook. But oh well, at least I gave them this video. So it all worked out in the end. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? <laughs>